Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to this Ask ICAST webinar, Impact Reporting, How Charities Communicate the Difference They Have Made. This series of webinars gives members an opportunity to find out more and ask questions on a range of topics. I'm James Barber, the Director of Policy Leadership here at ICAST, and I'll be guiding you through this webinar. We have to put up our disclaimer slide just to make everyone absolutely clear the, the terms on which this uh, webinar is being provided. And I do have to mention that the webinar provides general commentary on the topics under discussion. As always, we would expect our members to use professional judgment and seek other appropriate professional or legal advice where appropriate when dealing with matters under today's topic area. In today's webinar, you will hear from members of the academic team from Cardiff University and Victoria University of Wellington about their phase one findings and recommendations from ICAS funded research into impact practice and reporting by UK charities. In phase one of the research, the team focused on how charities approach the challenges and opportunities arising from demonstrating the difference they have made. A report on those phase one findings will be available soon. You will then also hear from pioneering financial education charity Red Star about how it is approaching impact measurement. I would also highlight at this time that phase two of this research project is already underway. And during this phase, the team will analyze impact reports prepared by charities and engage with charity funders to gauge their views on the importance of measuring and demonstrating impact. I'm delighted this morning to be joined by the following four speakers. Firstly, Dr. Alpa Danani is a leader at Cardiff University. Alpa is principal investigator for this research project. She has extensive experience of research into not-for-profit entities, charities, non-governmental organizations, and the like, focusing principally on their accountability practices. Alpa's interest in the not-for-profit sector lies beyond academia. She volunteered for Black Association of Women Step Out, a Welsh charity that specialises in Black and ethnic minority victims of domestic abuse and was subsequently a board member and chair. Secondly, Dr. Alina Barutza is a lecturer at Cardiff University. Alina specialises in the area of management control and performance measurement systems. She has experience undertaking research on models and frameworks used to measure and report performance internally in various organisational contexts. Alina is also a trustee of and the treasurer for the Management Control Association, a micro charity promoting research and scholarship in the area of management control and performance measurement. Next is Carolyn Cordery, who is adjunct professor of accounting at Victoria University of Wellington. Carolyn's research focuses on not-for-profit organizations accounting and accountability, particularly regulation. Carolyn is also chair of the New Zealand Accounting Standards Board and is a member of the Practitioner Advisory Group of the International Financial Reporting for Non-Profit Organisations Project, which is developing international financial reporting guidance for NPOs. And finally, Rodri Mason, who is the Chief of Staff at Legal and General Investment Management. In his role as Chief of Staff, Rodri is responsible for LGIM's global strategy, product and marketing teams. Rodri is also the Chief Executive Officer of Legal and General Trust, sorry, Legal and General Unit Trust Managers Limited, as well as being the lead executive responsible for LGIM's relationship with key client legal and general retirement. Rodri is also chair of the Board of Trustees at Red Start, a charity committed to educating young people in personal finance, and that's the capacity that Rodri will be here today. So welcome to all our presenters and welcome to the audience to today's webinar and thank, thank, thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak to us today. So firstly, I have to give you a few housekeeping matters before we can start the, the main proceedings. So before we, we begin, before we begin, just a few housekeeping matters to remind you. Firstly, you can submit questions anytime through the live Q&A facility, which can be accessed at the right hand side of your screen. Questions can be submitted anonymously or only to the presenters for this webinar if you wish. We won't identify who questions come from. Please also join the conversation today through the discussion forum, also accessed at the right-hand side of your screen. 
The forum allows you to comment or discuss with fellow attendees on matters covered by this webinar. We are recording this webinar and we'll make it available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or more importantly, share it with others. The slides for the webinar will also be found alongside the on-demand video. Both the recording and the associated documents will be available at icast.com forward slash events. Everyone in the webinar is automatically muted, so there is no need to be concerned about background noise wherever you are. We look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinar, and of course, we will try to get through as many as possible. I will now hand over to Alina and Carolyn to provide an update on the research they have undertaken. Alina, please. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you, James, for this lovely presentation. Uh, I'm Elena Varuza, and thank you for having us here today to be able to present our research findings to the ICAS audience. We're going to talk about the research we conducted into charities impact uh, practices with the aim to inform the upcoming SORP, uh, the charity's statement of recommended practice, which provides guidance to preparers of charities account. So, um, as James already mentioned, we are a team of four and we come from different uh, research backgrounds and we bring different expertise into um, this project. So, today I will talk about the phase one results and the focus of this um, stage of the research was to examine how charities develop and use impact measurement internally and how they translate this uh, into impact reporting, so external communication of impact. Uh, in order to get a breadth of responses, we conducted um, a sector level uh, online survey. We got 70 responses, both from charities who currently engage with impact practice and charities who are not currently involved into the practice of impact. In order to gain an in-depth understanding of charities' um, position and viewpoints, we also conducted semi-structure interviews with 20 organizations. So we started our research by asking what is impact? There is no common understanding of what constitutes impact. Impact is seen as the effectiveness uh, of organizations' activities in achieving their mission, whereas according to the input impact framework, which is the graph you see on the right side of your screen, impact is the difference made as a consequence of the charitable interventions. It is considered to go beyond the outputs, which are your deliverables, and to more immediate outcomes, your achievements, in order to capture the long-lasting and more sustainable chains. The charities we researched, they echoed SORP's viewpoint on uh, that impact is a notion of good practice and that impact should be endorsed and promoted. And they wanted, um, and they echoed SORP's definition that impact uh, captures the difference made. Impact is beyond and above everything uh, else that the difference made by your charitable interventions. But we did find some notable differences where impact can mean different things in different contexts. And these differences were down into the nature of activities in which the organization engages. To give an example, uh, we came across charities that their role was to satisfy emergent imminent needs, like food bank, for example, where they try to help someone hunger now. They don't deal with the long term issues or charities that they set up during the recent pandemic uh, in order to um, distribute quick cash money during COVID. So they saw a need and they tried to cover for that. They didn't investigate how and the long-term effect of that. So they focused on their outputs. Whereas charities uh, involved in uh, ongoing interventions uh, on policy and campaigning like uh, overcoming homelessness 
or improve underprivileged children's understanding uh, of financial issues uh, were more outcome oriented. Even uh, within that level, we observed differences over the, different, uh, over the time frame. Some were capturing their impact soon after the charitable interventions, and others were taking a longer, um, a longer term view, two years and above, for example. So charities must recognize their unique context when they, when they tell their own story. Uh, we found that for charities, impact is a journey. We observed a diversity of maturity in impact practice. Um, so charities, some charities were in the early stages uh, of understanding impact, capturing impact, um, and they were still trying to uh, identify the appropriate measures for them. But at the same time, charities who have already been through that stage, they continuously question uh, and continuously evaluate their impact uh, measurement and approach. So it was, a, a, it was an, an evolving uh, process. In terms of motives, we found that both internal and external factors drove charities to engage in impact measurement. Our responders unanimously asked about the uh, sorry. Our responders unanimously answered that appealing to future funders was the most. Imp I'm sorry, I've changed the slide accidentally. Okay, <laughs> our responders unanimously answered that appealing to future funders was the most important motivator, followed by another external motivator to respond better to current funders' demands. So both external motives. However, when we asked them about the benefits achieved, uh, they were they uh, they were uh, focused on internal uh, benefits and the most important one unanimously was that they were able to understand better how their charity is performing against its set vision mission and objectives hence we recommend that charities need to see beyond any hurdles because it is for value mainly to them not only for external drivers to uh, capture impact. Talking about hurdles, uh, charities who are not engaged in impact practice, they have identified that resource constraints like finance or people constraints were the main issues for not being able to engage with impact. Hence, we do recommend that funders dedicate funding to assist with impact practice. They could provide resources specifically for that, uh, either by include impact resourcing within project funding or establishing a dedicated pool of funds by a consortium of funders that charities can apply for to initiate their impact practice. Charities who currently engaged in impact practice, they identified that the biggest hurdle was capturing impact, capturing impact itself. So we recommend that a sub-sector level collaboration among charities would enable them to understand better the impact they need to capture for their journey. We found out that a variety of staff, uh, both internal and external, uh, are engaged in impact measurement, including the preparation and review of internal reports. CEOs were the most common group involved in developing impact measures and also in reporting and reviewing impact reports. Whereas specialist impact managers was the most popular group involved in data collection and analysis. Interestingly, finance directors, who is the main audience of SORP, was a less popular choice. Hence, we recommend that SORP should also target non-accountants and be in an accessible format to them. <clears throat> 
Trustees also play the role mainly in internal reporting, second to CEOs, but also in developing measures. We do recommend that trustee boards should be prepared for impact practice, and this was highlighted in one of our interviewees, where they set up a board level subcommittee with a sole role to question and challenge management in terms of impact. In terms of external actors, some organizations, albeit fewer, uh, they chose external actors such as consultants and funders. Working together, co-producing metrics to the, is to the mutual advantage of all parties. Funders, often we found that often they stipulate their own set of metrics, which may have little utility to the organization reporting them. Hence, funders and charities should work together and the funders can even bring a set of charities, a, a group of charities working together to develop appropriate metrics who will further enable charities with their charitable interventions. Knowledgeable organizations such as accounting firms and consultancies can also assist charities with their impact journey. So, impact practice in action, we found that charities use a potpourri of framework. And as you would expect, given the different uh, understanding, different definitions of uh, what is impact, and given the, the variety in practice of the charitable activities, we came across um, quite a range of formal frameworks like a uh, theory of change, social balance scorecard, log frames, but also charities often engage with, um, with customized frameworks that they were relevant to their own uh, activities. We also came across data collected at a variety of levels. Data were collected uh, at an activity by activity level or at a subset of activities, or even at an organizational level. Data could have been externally collected, internally, or both. Um, data were uh, numerical, quantitative, like um, statistics on users, attendance rates, uh, users' financial gains, but also qualitative data uh, like personal stories, case studies, focus discussion groups were seemed valuable. Several interviewees highlighted the need for data collection to be embedded into business as usual and subsequently provide appropriate education and training for the data collectors and as a second step for the data analysts. Hence, a bent impact practice within business as usual provide this organizational culture will gain a buy-in from the board to train staff and volunteers. I'm, I don't know how the, the slide changed this time. Um, so we also, uh, we also found um, a contradiction, a mix-up of impact and feedback. We found that very often these terms were changed, uh, were used interchangeably. Um, feedback was often collected through um, surveys, feedback surveys, and charities were engaged into those to identify the service quality, the quality of the services they were provided. And although impact data may be captured within, within that survey, not all data are related with impact. So charities should make the distinction and cautiously engage to impact assessment exercise and collect impact related data as part of their feedback surveys. Now, at this stage, I will pass on to my colleague Caroline, where she will talk about the principles and impact uh, reporting. Thank you. Thank you, Elena and Kuratato. Um, you can see that the impact measures are very varied and uh, at, at low levels and at higher levels within the organisation. So what we were interested in was what principles are actually driving 
the gathering of those impact measures. And you can see here we've listed them in a level of importance. The most relevant issue to all charities that uh, answered our survey was how important the impact data was from the perspective of the beneficiaries. And following that, what was the magnitude? What, what, uh, how much was the impact going to be on the communities that they served? As well, the, uh, the participants were interested in the impact measures being action focused so that the delivery of a charity could be uh, reformed according to how impact was being, um, being shown through that measurement. And as well, obviously trying to get uh, impact measures that were able to be measured and simple enough to be able to be used at all levels of the organisation was seen to have relevance in the development of what measures were going to be used. So moving from measurement to actually reporting, um, the, obviously the main uh, incentive to report the impact was to meet funded demands because we saw that that was the reason why um, charities were actually developing impact measures to start with. But when we uh, inquired of charities through the survey and through interviews, we found that internal uh, motives might have played a less significant role in the decisions to report impact, but later on we can find that actually the internal benefits were really uh, felt to be uh, quite more positive than, than initially um, was the case. So the primary motivation was to attract fun funding um, to, to, to measure impact, but when it was reporting, it was not so much about the funding. Now, while the SORP has recommendations on how to undertake uh, or the fact that impact reporting is a good idea, um, there was various me media being used by charities to report their impact information. So the SORP informs the trustees annual report, and that was the most popular medium, but other channels such as um, uh, the funder-specific applications and reports, websites and social media were also important communication tools for impact reporting. Some charities prepare voluntary impact reports, uh, perhaps on their websites, which enables them to have some interactive engagement, much more interactive than perhaps a trustee's annual report. But despite the variety in communication, most survey participants used the same impact measures, both for internal and external audi audiences. Where there were different impact measures, it was generally because internally they were more complex and perhaps detailed, and then they were uh, um, summarised up for, uh, for external reporting. So given the variety of channels through which impact is reported and the audiences that are used, um, we recommend that charities align the impact communication tools with the information needs of their audiences and to adjust the frequency of voluntary impact reporting to reflect the longer term nature of their activities. Now some interviews revealed that uh, their charities were reluctant to share details of any activities that fell short of expectations, so perhaps some uh, hadn't quite reached some benchmarks, um, and that there was more of an emphasis on positive contributions. And we believe that this contradicts the SORP's notion of balanced reporting. So our second recommendation here is that charities use sufficient quantitative and qualitative data when reporting impact information to give stakeholders an appropriate view of the organisation and to enhance their trust in charities. And as well, it could be that uh, internal audits would help in verification of data and that would increase stakeholders' confidence. Larger charities might seek to verify their impact reporting practice and strengthen the credibility of the information disclosed through using independent assurers. Who's involved then in undertaking this reporting? Well, again, a variety, because we asked about who prepared the trustees annual report and the voluntary impact report. 
With regards to the trustees annual report, the CEOs and trustees took the lead, but in voluntary impact reports, we saw the CEOs taking charge as well as specialist impact managers. Audit firms were also seen to have an influential role in preparing the trustees or helping with preparation of the trustees annual report uh, and finance directors and communication and fundraising departments and service managers were also involved, but to a lesser degree. Because of the variety of people who are involved in impact reporting, we believe it would be important as the SORP is developed over the next couple of years to widen its accessibility to include non-accountants and other members, uh, other people who are involved in impact practice. So we spoke about the principles that drove impact measurement. What about the principles that drive impact reporting? Um, although measurability was not deemed a top priority in charities' impact measurement, it was the second most relevant principle used in charities' impact reporting behind the importance that was obviously also important uh, with measurement. Verifiability seems more relevant to impact reporting than measurement, which is interesting because there is no requirement to have uh, impact reporting assured at this stage in the UK. And finally, impact reporting data, charities felt it needed to be action focused. So what are charities looking for in the way of guidance to help them undertake this impact reporting practice? We asked this at organisational, subsector and sector level. Sector-wide guidance was welcomed as it would be useful for individual organisations and encourage comparabilities between charities engaged in similar activities. According to interviewees, guidance should comprise examples of best practice for impact measurement and reporting, and at different levels, small charities right through to large charities. And there are ideas that engaging with impact professionals and the development of peer support groups could be additional ideas to help charities improve their impact practice. But the participants in this stage of the research showed less support for a standard, the requiring uh, reporting to drive forward uh, impact reporting. And given that the sector is very diverse, some interviewees expressed concerns that a standard could be too prescriptive and not relevant to different types of charities. But the charities engaged in impact practice that we interviewed and who also responded to the survey showed a sort of moderate level of support for self-certification, whereas charities that didn't report uh, didn't really want to have any sort of certification or kite mark or, or any sort of assurance on their impact reporting. So we recommend, therefore, that there's collaboration between organisations at a subsector level within the charity sector to move forward some of those ideas of a community of practice or some way of supporting each other in impact practice. Through this, char charities can share experiences and work together to develop impact metrics. And as well, there's a space for umbrella bodies at subsector level to support a collaborative approach to enhance impact practice development. There's a lot more I could say about the research uh, at phase one. As we said, there's a report that will be published soon. But the team is actually moving on to our phase two study, which has two, uh, phase two of the study, which has two objectives. We will be, uh, can, or we are considering content analysis of two years of annual documents of case study organisations, not just their trustees annual report, but other impact material that they are disclosing. And we're going to explore the nature and characteristics across those charities, across those years. And as well, given the prevalence of uh, dependence on funders and, and desire to meet funders' needs, We'll be undertaking semi-structured interviews with major funders from case study organisations and supplementing that with some uh, focus groups or roundtable discussions with other funders. And at this stage, I'm going to hand over uh, for discussion. Um, 
And if I do that, I will say thank you very much for listening and we look forward to your comments. Thanks very much, Carolyn. Uh, and it was great to get the insights there from yourself and Alina in terms of phase one of the research, which really shows that it's doing uh, tremendous uh, work there and trying to find out and really get to the bottom of impact reporting and, and how we can take this forward and the challenges which charities are obviously facing. And obviously one of those challenges and that's one of the questions we probably will come back to later on in the Q&A session. But I'm now pleased that uh, I'll be handing over to Roger Mason, who will be giving us a perspective on, on impact reporting from uh, the Red Start charity, which provides financial education to pupils at school. So without any further ado, I'll now hand over to Roger. Uh, many thanks, James. And thank you, Alina and Carolyn, for the for the very interesting insights. Hopefully what some of what I'm going to say um, bears out some of what you found in your research as well. Um, so I'm Rodri Mason, I'm Chair of Trustees at Red Start. Red Start is a charity that was founded 10 years ago, um, trying to give primary school aged children um, lessons in financial education. So how, how do you save money? How do you budget? How do you invest money? How does money grow? And the way we deliver that training to the kids, and this is typically 10 or 11 year olds, kind of year five, year six. Um, the way we deliver that training is through games. And so it's like a circuit, it's like circuit training in a gym. There's different tables that they can go to in the room and each table's got a different game they can play and that game is calibrated to a different financial risk reward level so there are some that are very very uh, risky they involve you know playing playing blackjack against a, a dealer with three hands and then there's one at the other end called the bank which gives you half percent interest and the, the idea is that the child at the end of the day who's got kind of got the most money um is the winner as it were um we've been doing that for many years very successfully but we appointed a new CEO last year and the new CEO uh, questioned us about whether our strategy was actually making a meaningful impact on the children's lives. What we've been doing is we've been getting primary schools to come in, spend a day at one of our uh, partner uh, organisations that we work with, typically a financial services provider. Uh, they have a lovely day out. They, they, it's a very memorable day out for them. But, we, but the new CEO said, do we think we're actually making an impactful, meaningful, persistent permanent, enduring difference to these kids' lives. And when we looked in the mirror, we thought, well, actually, maybe we're not. You know, maybe, maybe we're, we're all having a very nice time here, but we're not actually making, we're not actually making an impact. And crucially, we don't, we don't actually know either way. You know, our, our response was all based on gut feel and anecdote. There's no evidence, there's no data. So we sat down, we did a strategic review about a year ago and concluded that what we needed to do was to build impact into the proposition of the charity. And what that meant was we are going to, we're going to move from having the odd day out here, here and there for the, for the kids uh, across a very broad population of schools to just going deep rather than broad with much fewer schools. So the new strategy is we've kind of effectively got married to 50, 50 schools across the UK in, in, in five different regions, including a number in Scotland, um, and we are going to we're going to deliver multi year financial education with the same cohort of kids all the way through primary school. And that will be from reception, you know, all the way up to year uh, uh, year six uh, when when they you know, when they when they leave the school. And the idea is the hypothesis is financial habits start young. And if we can make this part of their training and their education as they go, uh, they'll they'll leave school and go to secondary school with those financial habits already ingrained in their life. Um, and we thought this was a powerful hypothesis. We talked about it with the schools. The schools are very keen to come on board. We're only dealing with schools in the areas of most financial need. Uh, so we're trying, to, we're trying to go to places where we think will make a real difference. Um, but the clincher, when we went to see our fundraisers, when we, went to get this, when we went to see the sponsorship, the clincher was the fact that we were going to measure the impact of doing this. So I suppose the one key message I'd like to leave everyone with today is that for us, impact isn't just about communicating how we're doing impact is core to the proposition itself it's core to what it's core to the, the fact we are measuring impact is core to why people fund us because corporate funders corporate partners want to be able to say if i've given this charity x thousand pounds i want they want to be able to link that directly to good outcomes for the children involved and once we had established our impact measurement program 
um, that was the thing that turbocharged our fundraising. That was the thing that really took us to the next level in our fundraising. So how did we do impact? Um, you know, per some of the per some of the comments that Alina made earlier, uh, you know, it was clear that we weren't going to be able to do that ourselves. We weren't credible. We were, you know, we were very, you know, we were biased, and that wasn't going to give our funders the the, the object, objectivity and neutrality they needed to have confidence in the results coming out. So we actually engaged. We 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 actually engaged three different universities in the UK. We had we did basically a kind of a request for proposal process, and we ended up contracting with King's College London. Uh, so King's are going to be doing a three year a, th a minimum three year study, hopefully seven year study. If 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 the hypothesis shows that this is starting to bear some fruit with the kids, we'll you know we'll, we'll kick on, we'll carry on, and King's are going to write a report that is measuring. Uh, outcomes for children so it will measure their financial literacy obviously but it would also measure their numeracy and, and benefits to you know the, their their math lessons I suppose from having financial education in the classroom and we're also trying to measure with them social mobility so does this have does this have an outcome on 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 children from you know um, kind of quite deprived areas uh, or in some cases very deprived areas does it have an outcome on their social mobility and, and outcomes into secondary education going forward. So that's the first stage of the impact measurement. And then the second stage is we persuaded the a management consulting firm called Boston Consulting Group, or BCG, to take the King's data and write a social return, uh, a, a social return on investment report. So a social impact return on investment report. So they're going to take the data that King's are producing and they're going to say, well, if you extrapolated this data forward for the whole of the UK, um, what would this mean in terms of uh, lower rates of de depression and mental illness, uh, improved jobs in the economy, uh, you know, uh, less people in debt uh, and, and all the attendant problems that go with that? They're, try they're trying to basically put a pounds, shillings and pence number on. Uh, what would this look like if you rolled this out nationwide? Because our ultimate goal as a charity is to take this reporting to the UK government and have them change the primary school curriculum. You know, the theory of change here is we think we can impact about 15,000 children's lives directly through what we're doing. You know, in these 50 schools, we think we think we'll, we'll reach 15,000 children. But what we want to do is reach millions of children by proving the business case to the government that this should be on the primary school curriculum um, because of the outcomes that we think it will deliver. So there's so we've got King's College doing the doing the academic study. We've got Boston Consulting Group. Uh, extrapolating that out into kind of a pound, shillings and pence financial impact. And then finally, we've got a company called Rubico. So Rubico are a fund management house um, based in Holland who are known for being very, uh, you know, uh, very expert in environmental, social and governance um, fund management. And, and Rubico are actually going to track the outcomes related to the, U the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So for those, for the, I'm sure everyone on this call knows what the SDGs are. So we'll be trying to, again, say to funders, oh, because you funded this, you have driven some sort of outcome in SDG number seven or number nine or number 10. And, and of course, the, the point of all this is to A, influence government at the end of it, B, to show the schools and the parents of these children the impact that we're making on, the, on that cohort of children's lives. But crucially, it's to show the funders. It's so that the funders can say in their annual report, you know, we gave X thousand pounds to this charity. And as a result, all of these excellent outcomes occurred. Um, and I, 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 I just I can't underemphasize. I can't overstate, sorry, um, how important this has been to the charity. So a year ago, we had one funder and we had a turnover of about 200,000 pounds a year through this process and it's been the impact that has clinched the sale if you like with the funders we've tripled our turnover and we're now up to 15 funders so we've massively diversified our funding base um, and we've and we've also increased the total amount of, of of money we've been able to raise and that's in part because we've got a better proposition you know a multi-year offering is better than a come in for the day and have a nice day out type proposition that we used to have but it also it is also very crucially the impact measurement um, that's the thing that moves people from, uh, you know, in the sales conversation, that's the thing that moves people from, oh, what an interesting idea. It, it'd be great to learn more to, oh, okay, I can really see how I can tell my shareholders about this. I can really see how this goes into my annual report. Um, uh, and so uh, I wanted to say two things. First is impact is not just great for communicating outcomes. It's actually also core to how you can build and sell your proposition as a charity. 
Uh, and the second thing I wanted to say was a huge thank you to, to ICAST, to this organization uh, who've been uh, phenomenal at supporting us as we've moved out from being very London centric um, into other regions and particularly in Scotland. We're very grateful for your support. Uh, and, um, and I'll leave it there. I think that's my 10 minutes. So uh, back to you, James. Thank you. Thanks very much there, Roger. That was a, a great update there and, and the work that has been done by Redstart and the changes you're making and really how impact really is at the heart of what you're doing. And thanks very much for your praising ICAST. And on that, I would really like to thank Christine Scott, who really has been fundamental in what ICAST has been doing there and the pensions panel who have supported us. So great work all round. So the first question uh, I'm going to put to the research team, and uh, I believe Danani is going to deal with the questions from the research, and that is, of all the greatest challenges experiencing and demonstrating your impact, what do you think is the greatest? So of all the challenges challenges experienced and demonstrating their impact, what do you think is the greatest? Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, James, and I'll, I'll kick off with, with addressing this question. So for charities that have actively engaged in impact practice, uh, they recognise the importance of measuring impact. And this is particularly, uh, as Carolyn alluded to earlier, it's from the context of beneficiaries, so how beneficiaries are being aided through the charity's work. But the biggest problem charities seem to have is accurately measuring the impact that they may be having. So a lot of times we're having to rely on proxy measures and it's whether these proxy measures are accurately feeding in to beneficiaries' experiences. So if I can elaborate that with, with a small example, if I may, uh, one of the charities we spoke to offers a mentoring programme to students, pupils from uh, secondary schools in uh, high deprivation areas and it's a 10-week mentoring program and at the end of it uh, the charity is trying to assess things like confidence levels, hope um, and so forth and the question here is when they're getting the students to address answer questionnaires which tap into confidence levels, hope etc, is that 10-week period sufficient to have driven these changes and also there could have been a variety of other variables that may feed into the pupil's hope and confidence. So it's that measurement that seems to be the most challenging aspect that charities are trying to grapple with. Thank you. And just on that, Danani, do you think that's going to be even more of an issue for smaller charities who may not have the same level of resource, obviously, as the larger ones? So we had a few cha small charities in our sample. Uh, a lot of the charities that we had in our sample, as Alina alluded to, provided core services, so offering um, money during the, the pandemic or food banks, so pony clubs, that sort of thing. So addressing impact for them was lesser of an issue. Uh, so they, they were just delivering the goods and they felt that was their impact, you know, giving children the opportunity to ride or relieving somebody's debt issues, providing food assistance. So the impact there was perceived slightly differently to the charity that I've just mentioned in terms of mentoring. Thanks very much. I know a question for Rodri, and, and first of all, a statement from one of our attendees who very impressed with the multi-year approach that you're adopting but the question is do you publish the lessons or the session plans so that other schools not in the scheme can copy if they wish to help them scale up in the same sort of way and is there a demand for that Rodri? Yeah thank you thanks for the feedback um, and it's a great question we do actually publish resources online already so there are videos online um, if you go to the, the website it's called I think redstareducate.com org i think um i'll try and i'll try and find it and drop it in, in the chat uh but the, the website uh, lets you sign up and access resources and there's also there's also videos and things on on youtube if you search for red star educate it's fair to say some of the materials are a bit out of date so we've been mo we're launching this new strategy uh next week so we're in kind of mobile we're in kind of mobilization phase at the moment over the course of the next year we'll be tidying those up to make them available 
um, to people. We, uh, we, we, we sort of moved online to provide the resources um, during COVID, like a lot of people. You know, we, we had a completely, we had a completely in-person physical delivery based model. And when COVID hit, we had to do something to, uh, we, we were trying, we were telling ourselves we were, the, we were the financial education Joe Wicks people. I'm not sure we had quite the, um, we had quite the same number of hits as him, but that was the idea at the time. Thanks, Roger. I'm sure you did. Uh, but whether you'll be able to measure that impact, I don't know. I don't actually have the results to hand. But uh, another question's come in for Danani. Uh, and it's the question is, what was the main factors in organisations stating they didn't want to see a standard of impact reporting? Is it that most believe these sorts of standards drive everyone to come and boilerplate reporting, which is little, little meaningful value? That would be the concern of this particular uh, participant in the webinar. Yes, uh, I think you've answered answered the question that, that you actually raised. And this was a concern with lots of charities that having a formula that was a standard formula would actually lose the value of impact because impact is so specific to individual organisations. So as Rodri has just mentioned, they're going for the multi-year approach, given that the educational programme is focused on, on throughout the children's education. Uh, so, so that was definitely a, a sticking point. There was some consensus over having subsector level consistency. So um, educational charities may home in on similar types of impact measures. Um, health charities may do something similar, children's charities. So at a subsector level, there is some scope for standardization. And hence, one of our recommendations is, um, as Carolyn mentioned, collaboration at a subsector level, so that with charities struggling to develop impact measures, having that kind of input from multi organizations working in a similar area may actually help to pro progress further on this impact agenda for the sector as a whole. Thanks so much, Danani. A question to Rodri. Rodri, if we were looking, say, five, ten years ahead, what would success look like to you in terms of impact? Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's we, that's a really good question. We um, some one of our funders asked us recently if you don't if you don't manage to change the government policy, have you failed? Which was um, was we, we, which was a bit of, sort of an eye opener as a question. We thought, crikey, have we failed? You know, the, the ultimate goal is to. Uh, get financial education on the primary school curriculum. Um, Ten years ago when we started, there was no financial education anywhere. It is now delivered, I think, somewhat patchily, aged 14 to 16, but it's, I, I don't think it's um, what you'd call a core subject. So success for us is really changing the lives of millions of children by having this delivered on, on, the, on the primary school curriculum, with us hopefully providing some of the materials. You know, we, 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 we hopefully we'd be just becoming a provider of materials to the government at that stage because the government's taken it on. Having said that, you know, the downside scenario, which is we've only only impacted 20,000 children's lives, or whatever it is. If we can get there, that's a pretty good fallback position. You know, we, we, we've we tried to pick schools where um, we think we can make a real difference to the, we can make a real impact to the children's lives involved. And ultimately, if the King's study is telling us that we've changed, you know, north of 10,000 children's lives through our efforts. I, I still think we will count that as a success. It's just not the, it's just not the goal. You know, the goal is to prove that this works and help the government, you know, get to the conclusion that they want to do this and, and then help and then help them to actually build and deliver it. Thanks very much, Rodri. A very challenging question. So a very good answer. Uh, another question. The academics addressed the why question rather than how. Rodri addressed how by having three external firms who will be presumably paid to produce the reports. Many charities will not be able to hire externally due to lack of financial resource. So what is their solution to the how question? Danani, could you provide some perspective on that, please? Um, yes, so this was a sticking point for lots of our organisations. Um, and there were two suggestions that we've made one which we hope to explore further as phase two comes along is asking funders to actually dedicate some funding towards impact 
measurement and hopefully given Rodri's experience you know this this can become the norm that part of the funding is dedicated to actually capturing the difference that organizations are making and our second suggestion was and this has been practiced a little bit in the past is for a consortium of organizations to come together and have a pot of money dedicated for um, impact evaluation and then charities can apply for that funding very similarly uh, to applying for funding for their core activities. Uh, funding is, is a deep concern for charities at the best of times. So often putting aside funding for evaluation is, is looked at taking it away from beneficiary groups and therefore looked upon negatively. So these resources would, would help, we hope, to address that gap. Could I just could I add to that, James? Just just yeah. to build on what Alpa's saying there. We're, we're of the three sort of impact measurement groups we've got involved. We're only actually paying one. We're only we're only paying King's College. So BCG and Rubico are giving their their time for free. And a piece of advice I would give charities is is to bear in mind that a lot of corporates give their staff dedicated dedicated CSR days. You know, most most companies I've worked at, you'll get something like three days a year that you can spend giving to a charity. And the problem is often um, you end up with professional services people going off and trying to paint schools, right? Or going off and installing carpets and, and they do it badly um, and it's not leveraging their own skill set. And so part of our pitch to, uh, to BCG, for instance, is to say, here's how you can leverage your own professional skills in a way that is relevant um, and, and, and um, you can get your staff energized about the fact that they're using their professional skills to help support this charity using the CSR days that you give them. Um, if I use, you know, if I, if I use an example from my day job, um, we've got the legal and general marketing team doing a lot of the marketing for Red Start. So that website link that's in the chat, that was actually built by my my team at work, and they're doing it with the with the with the staff volunteering days we already give them. It's just they're doing something that relates to their marketing skill set. So just as an alternative idea, that's that's one to think about talking to corporates and, and funders to as well. Thanks very much, both. A question from the audience. To prove that a beneficiary's health and well-being has been improved by an arts charity, how would one best go about this? I'll probably give that one to you to begin with. Um, I can certainly attempt. So we, we haven't actually spoken to any charities working uh, in this specific area, but we have worked with two charities uh, which come to mind at the moment. One was a homelessness charity and one was a substance misuse charity. And they've both got quite professionally de developed questionnaires that they're sort of getting their beneficiary groups to engage with and then sort of doing a um, before intervention survey and then part way through the interventions and then the end game and looking at the difference that um, the interventions have made to those individuals. Now, this is, I think, where that kind of subsector level collaboration would come in useful rather than individual charities all trying in, in that field of well-being, trying to develop their own surveys and so forth. It may help to come together to develop something like this and, and something that Rodri has alluded to, drawing in on expertise. So universities are, are a prime example where um, charities can draw on expertise from. So, so developing surveys on that basis that can be used progressively through the beneficiary's journey. Thanks very much, Alpha. And Rodri, how did Red Star approach the issue of some or perhaps a substantial part, sorry, of the new funding going to pay consultants costs rather than going directly on charitable activities? Now, I'm not sure whether you have paid or not, but you can obviously address that one. Was there any resistance or did it just involve more explanation? Yeah, the consultants were, were free. That it's a pro bono activity for them, as, as, I, as I explained. But we, we are paying King's College London. Uh, it's very much just it's very much just about being transparent about about what you're trying to do. Um, a big part of how we've managed to secure this new round of fundraising has been through saying to people, we're going to have objective, neutral, fully academic um, uh, measurement of the impact we're all making together as a, as a you know as a community around the charity we've been upfront about that from the get-go people know they're getting that they're getting paid we've created a we've created a 
we have a semi-annual meeting between kings and the funders and the charity so everyone can discuss the research and see what's coming out you know it's very much embedded in what we do and we're upfront about it. it you know it's a very fair challenge that if you're you have to be transparent i think if you're not transparent about it it, it is very optically difficult to to go and pay external organizations for this for this sort of thing but we're clear it's a significant you know it's a significant portion of our budget um but but it's but it's core to what we're trying to do because that's how we persuade the government and people people have signed up on on that basis thanks very much one final question and it's just i want to ask both of you if you have one point you would really like to highlight for the audience to take away from this webinar in terms of impact reporting what would it be alpa can i come to you first and um, i would say the importance of measuring impact. Uh, Rodri's already alluded the, to this from the perspective of attracting the funding. But something that we found certainly in the survey was lots of charities were keen on this idea of uh, impact measurement or impact practice to generate that funding, but actually the benefit internally to beneficiary groups. And again, this is something that Rodri's alluded to, um, how the activities could be tweaked and amended to maximise the impact on beneficiary groups were seen to be the biggest benefit. So there's internal and an external benefit. So, so the value of impact, I think, is, is key here. Thanks very much, Al. Roger? I, I just, I just observed that um, the impact that you think you want to measure as a charity might not be the one that, that um, your funders are interested in. We, we thought we were going to go and measure, you know, how, do people know how to budget and save and grow their money for the future? In talking to the funders and the academics, it became clear that there was a whole host of other things that we could measure that we hadn't, frankly, candidly thought of around numeracy and particularly around social mobility. Um, so I suppose the message would be to talk about talk 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 about socialise with your with, with your network what impacts you're trying to measure because they often will have you know better insights and ideas than you than you may do at the get go. That's great, Roger. Thanks very much. So. Thanks to all of our speakers, to Alina, Carolyn, Alpa and, and Rodri for your insights this morning. So it's now time to, to wrap up, which I think has been an absolutely excellent session and really tremendous insights which have been provided. So thanks once again to your speakers. Uh, some of the questions haven't been able to be answered, but we will look at these after the event and we will post our answers to those particular questions. Uh, and they will be available in a Q&A document, which will be available alongside the recording of this webinar at icast.com forward slash events. Please remember that you can keep up to date with the latest information, guides and resources through icast.com for all your financial reporting, tax and general practice areas. And you can access technical support through the ICAST Technical Help Desk, which covers audit and accounting, tax, practice support, anti-money laundering and ethics. And just looking ahead to some future webinars which are coming up next week uh, at the usual time, 11 to 12, the Ask ICAST webinar is focusing on implementing the quality management standards, of course, which were originally uh, published by the International Auditing Assurance Board and the FRC has then published their UK version. So we'll be covering that next week. And also I'd like to highlight from the 4th to the 6th of October, the ICAST annual CA summit, and this is our flagship award-winning virtual conference. Lots of excellent speakers. You're able to, to dip in and out, and it suits you, and you can even come after the event. You know, the speakers on these events are really, really top-notch, and it's really, really worth signing up and making sure that you are involved. It only leaves me once again to thank our speakers and, of course, you, the audience, for joining the webinar today. I do hope it has been helpful. I've certainly found it very insightful. And it would be great to receive your feedback in this webinar and to hear any future topics you would like us to cover. So, so thanks for joining us. And until next time, goodbye. Thank you.